Good morning, my friends, and thank you for joining me, and I apologize for being late. I ended up talking with some friends, and time got away from me. Uh, it's good to see you. The uh, pollen is higher than usual. I think it's the pollen right now, and so um, it's causing me to, to, you know, to feel a certain amount of drain. Um, Thank you, Dina. Can you fill that up with the Cypher Hills water? Um, anyway, hope you guys are doing well. And again, sorry for coming on late. Um, I just lost track of time. Started talking to friends. And uh, people pop into my office, especially on Wednesday. We have a lot of people here on Wednesday. Good to see you. Sheila is with us. And Rhonda's with us. I hope you guys are doing well. Um... Dina did our prayer meeting last night because um, I had a board meeting. So I want to thank you for joining Dina in, in prayer last night. Um, good morning, Shirley and Jan. You guys found me. Apologize for coming on kind of late. But I think I got a good one today. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. I'm, uh, I'm excited about this. I think it might be something that you will enjoy. It's something a little bit different. And sometimes I, I try to find devotions that are just not the norm. Uh, we've talked a lot about different topical things. We've talked about some very questionable things like, you know, um, even yesterday's devotion um, was um, a little bit different, you know, in that we were talking about are there different degrees or levels of hell? And um, I can tell you scholars and researchers are unsure about this. And good morning, Nancy. Good to see you. Um, but I try to tackle even difficult topics based on uh, not only uh, my theology and my understanding of doctrine, but also what I consider the importance of Scripture. I want to stay true to Scripture. Thank you, babe. And um, scripture interprets scripture. So we always look at what the Bible says, not what the commentators say, what the Bible says. And then we try to focus in on um, <clears throat> what scripture says about scripture. So that's how we try to get it right. Um, good morning, D Dari. I got on eight minutes late today, so I apologize, everybody. Um, if you can't find me, I know Pastor Pat has sent me a message um, saying, are you getting on? I hope she finds me. Um, if, if you try to get on, good morning, Diana. And there she is, Pastor Pat's joined us now. If you try to get on and can't find me, it's usually not you, it's probably me. It's the fact that I'm running late, and today I ran late, so I apologize. But it's a Waffle Wednesday. I had my waffle, I started my study, so I had my homework done, and then I got to talking to a friend. And time got away from me. So thank you for showing me patience and grace. We still have 15 on here, so that's good. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2. And as I said, I'm draining because I did not take my Zyrtec this morning. So I apologize. <laughs> I am out of Zyrtec. I've used up all my Zyrtec. And the pollen is really high. Lynn and Terry have joined me. Thank you, guys. Good to see you. <clears throat> Had a nice nice chat with Lynn yesterday via text message, and I'm glad you're doing well. Um, let, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> um, the reason why I picked this this morning, good morning, sweet Dina, is that I think a lot can be said about... Hebrews 2, we're not going to be looking at the entire chapter, but only some of it. But it's very good, and I want to read it in its entirety, and then I want to break it down for you if I can, okay? So it's warning to pay attention is the first part. We're going to take a look at the first part first. Thank you, Sheila. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. <clears throat> verse 2 for since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation 
This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed among, according to his will. I want to talk about that first. Uh, it's very important that we understand that this is a warning, my friends. A What is a warning? A warning is an indication that something needs to be paid attention to. It needs attention. It's a warning. There's a difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning. Okay? A tornado watch means that there's a possibility of some winds or I'm not sure how it works, Current, uh, wind current coming together that might create a tornado. That is a tornado watch. A tornado warning is there has been a sighting already of a tornado, and therefore warning, warning, warning. So the watch typ typically precedes the warning. Does that make sense to you? So when it says here in Hebrews chapter 2, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. This is a watch and a warning. Hebrews makes us pay attention to a point of application after the writer develops a principle. It's a scriptural fact that Jesus' superiority over the angels has life-changing application. The, the writer of Hebrews is reminding us that Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, right, the Alpha, the, the Omega, the beginning and the end, he works through angels to give warnings, to give a watch about certain things, even his own prophets, okay? Now, the Bible says we must give the more earnest heed. That's what it says. Now, that's just a different translation of verse 1 of chapter 2 of Hebrews. But this is what we must do in light of Jesus' superiority over angels. We must give more earnest, careful thought to what this message is that God wants us to hear, lest we drift away. That's what the Bible says. So that you do not drift away. The writer had the drifting of a boat in mind, and such drifting happens naturally without an anchor to something solid. Um, if we are not securely set in the truth of the supremacy of Jesus, we will drift into dangerous waters and the currents of the world and flesh and Satan schemes, my friends. We have to be grounded, we have to be anchored, or we will drift away. Now, the writer of Hebrews, we don't exactly know who the writer is. Some people say it's Apollos. Some people say it's Paul. Nobody knows for certain. Knew something about boats, okay? Everybody at that time knew something about boats. <clears throat> boats were um, a way of transportation, an easy way of transportation, getting from one side of an embankment to another. And so when you put down your anchor, your boat isn't going to go anywhere. It is solid, firm, and unmovable. And that's how you should be. When you drop your anchor, my friends, you are dropping your life on the Word of God. You are anchoring right here that what this says makes me unmovable. It makes me um, 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 so that I don't drift by staying in the Word of God, I, I don't get caught up with nonsensical theologies and doctrines that become somewhat worldly or even um, popular in our culture today. Let me tell you something. The writer of Ecclesiastes, which we know as Solomon, says there's nothing new under the sun. We know this. There's really nothing new under the sun. This new age isn't new. When people call about new age theology or new age thought to new age thinking. It's not really new, my friends. Don't you know that the, the Indians were new age? Or I should say the Native Americans were new age? Yeah, they were. They worshiped the sun and the moon and the stars and they were into genealogy and all these other things. And they, I'm sure, you know, there's been a lot of people that sacrificed, you know, to different gods and things like that. Um, so there's not a lot that is new, but we have to be careful, my friends, that we don't drift away. 
But the anchor has to be the Word of God. Now, Park Place is not your anchor. Good morning, guys. I see all your names there. Thank you for joining us. The Park Place is not your anchor. Park Place is basically the rope to the anchor, but the anchor is the Word of God. If you drop the anchor in the water, the anchor holds the boat in place by the rope. So think of a local church that believes in the Word of God, that teaches the Word of God as the rope. Therefore, Park Place is not your anchor. You can't put your faith in Park Place. You can't put your faith in me, even though you, you may have faith in me. It's a different type of faith. But your faith in, in salvation has to be in Christ. In Jesus is the Word made flesh. So he is our anchor. His Word is our anchor. And that which holds the anchor steady to the boat is the rope. And Park Place makes that applicable for us. Now, if, if listen to me, if the rope breaks, the boat becomes adrift. And I want to say to you that we all have a responsibility as leaders within the local church, and me especially as the pastor or shepherd of a local church, to make sure that rope does not break between the anchor that you are holding on to, which is the word of God, and your life, which is like a boat, which is wanting to go adrift. Why is it wanting to go adrift? Not because you're stubborn, but because the world has a current. And when I say that you have to go against the current, only by dropping your anchor and saying, you know what, I'm not going to move from this. I am steadfast. I am in the word. I'm learning and I am not going to drift away. I'm not going to slip uh, the, the, the local church that preaches the word of God is good. It's called Park Place. It holds the anchor, which is the word, and me, which is the boat, together. And that I won't drift. And it's a lot of responsibility, in my opinion. Now, the ancient Greek phrase for drift comes from the idea to slip. Okay? To slip off. It was used for an arrow slipping from the quiver, for snow slipping off a landscape, or a food slipping down the windpipe to cause choking. The word drift is associated with slip. It happens easily. One doesn't have to do anything to drift away. You see, drifting away is an automatic response. Don't you know that if you don't do anything, you're going to drift. A boat by itself, left alone, is going to drift. It's natural, my friends. The winds and the current will cause it to drift. Departure from the faith usually comes from slow drifting, oftentimes not a sudden departure. Now, I want to I want to share a quick story with you, Dean and I. <clears throat> We had taken our little boat. We've got a um, a little, um, uh, I think it, what's it called, a Key West? I think it's called a Key West boat. It's a little boat, a 20-footer, and we can put about six or eight people on it. It's a dual console type boat, outboard motor, and we take it over to John's Pass. Well, we decided to go over to John's Pass, and there's a kind of a sandy beach area, but we didn't roll up on the beach. We, we it, it's, it's about two or three feet deep. And so we decided to drop anchor there, jump out, and play around in the water a little bit. And it's where a lot of the other boats are. But I was having difficulty getting my anchor set in the sand. And what I noticed was um, she was putting out more rope, naturally. The rope was coming off the boat. And the more rope that came off the boat, she got further and further away from me. And because I couldn't set the anchor the way I needed to set the anchor, the boat was drifting and it meant that I, and I didn't have the strength to hold the anchor and to pull her back to me by even pulling the rope like this. What I had to do was I had to shout at her, you know, because she was far off and I had to say, Dina, start the motor and come back and I'll hold the anchor and then we can tie it down and make sure that it's anchored into the sand. And that's what we had to do. Um, so, it can be very exhausting. 
But let's look at verses two through four. Um, for since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? It's a very fair question. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him and also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and by gifts of the Spirit distributed according to his will. To his will. So, again, everything comes from the Lord first. The word spoken through angels is from the Lord. The angels don't speak on their own behalf. Remember in Jude, when Jude, um, who is the brother of Jesus, he wrote a little epistle. They were, uh, the archangel, I believe Michael, was disputing with um, Satan over uh, Moses' body. Did not even bring an accusation against Satan, but said, may the Lord rebuke you. So the angels take and fight the Lord's battles and take responsibility for the Lord, but they are under his command. Now, maybe you've never heard that, so look at Jude and you'll find that story. Jude is a very small epistle in the New Testament, um, but there was some discussion about uh, Moses' body, and you'll find that story. But the word is spoken through angels. This describes the messianic law, which was received by the direction of angels. Uh, the idea is that the law was delivered in some way by Moses, but also by angels. The idea that angels had a role in bringing the law of Moses is found in Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. And I think it's important that I take a look at this for you guys. Deuteronomy, you don't have to go there if you don't want to. I'll read it for you. But it's Deuteronomy 33, 2. And I'll just read it for you. It says this. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with myriads of holy ones from the south and his mountain slopes. So the Lord showed himself, okay? He came from Sinai, dawned over them, and he came with holy ones. Let's look at Acts 7, 53. If you still have your Bible open, flip over back over to the New Testament. Acts 7, we're looking at 53, the importance of angels. <clears throat> um, this is Stephen, okay, before he is stoned to death. We know him to be um, the, uh, one of the first martyrs. But um, he is basically giving a description of all of these acts that God had done in, in a wonderful, beautiful sermon just before his stoning, his death. If you look at Acts 7, 53, it says this, You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. So I want to make sure that you understand that the law wasn't written by Moses and, 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 and given to him by God, but it was given to him through a revelation by Jesus, by the Lord, through angels. Let's look at Galatians 3.19. So I'm going to ask you to flip over a little bit to your left. Galatians 3.19. And we're talking about angels here and them giving us the law. Galatians 3.19 says this, Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. Okay? So it's important for you to understand as we go back over to Hebrews chapter 2. Um, that we were given revelation through the angels as God instructed them. Now, do we think that they can rebel against God? That's already happened. 
we know that one third of the angels were cast out of heaven. So these are angels who are carrying out God's plan. And they prove to be steadfast. And then the verse says, how shall we escape? I think that's very fair. I think that's very fair. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received, it's just punishment. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? That's the question I want to ask you today. How can we escape if we are to ignore such a great salvation? The ancient Greek word translated neglect is amelisantis, amel, which is used in different pieces of scripture, but it basically means opportunity. So to neglect is to miss an opportunity, but to ignore or disregard the opportunity becomes your free will. You see, every one of you has a free will to do what you want to do, to believe what you want to believe, to rebel if you want to rebel. Jesus didn't save you to make you a robot so that you had to perform and fulfill the purpose that he called you to do. No, Jesus saved you because he loves you and wants to have a relationship with you so that you would reciprocate those feelings and then choose to love him, choose to obey him, choose to fulfill the purpose that he has for your life. And so remember that Hebrews was written not primarily as an evangelistic tract, but as an encouragement and warning to discourage Christians. There are many discouraged Christians, even in our world today. A lot of people are discouraged. Many of you at home are very discouraged. Hebrews is written to discouraged Christians. It was written to those who neglected to walk with Jesus, who were in um, violation and being stubborn and walking away from the Lord. And so I want to ask you again, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? Think about that. So great a salvation. When we consider something great, we will naturally pay attention to it. We won't neglect it. Now, I told Dina this year that if the Tampa Bay Bucks are in the Super Bowl, I do not want to go to a Super Bowl party. I do not want to have a Super Bowl party. Okay? I want to watch the game by myself because I get really excited, okay? And I don't want distractions. I want to stay focused because I love my team. I love my quarterback. I love my team. So naturally, the Bucs were in the Super Bowl and won the Super Bowl. But let me remind you, if the Bucs weren't in the Super Bowl, I probably wouldn't mind as much who won the game. Therefore, I would go to a Super Bowl party. I might even host a Super Bowl party. So we choose to pay attention to those things that are more important to us, my friends. What is it that is so important to you that you don't want any other distractions? Say, Pastor, that's kind of a stretch. I mean, you really are a fan. Let me tell you something. I love the Bucks, and I enjoyed the game, and we won 31 to 9. I loved every second of it. And it's not that I don't like being with people. But when my team is playing, I don't want to be distracted. When I'm at church on Sunday, I want to worship. Now, I'm not saying worship and football are the, are the same, but I want to worship. It's why I sit in the front. It's why I want to focus on the words on the screen. It's why I want the Lord to speak to me. When I wake up in the morning, I don't have Fox News on while I'm reading my Bible. I don't play music while I'm reading my Bible. That might work for you. That's fine, I guess. But I just want this. I don't want to be distracted. Do you see, do you see what I'm saying? I, I'm simply saying that those things that are important to us, we put first and foremost. And we don't want to be distracted with anything else. So if we neglect so great a salvation, then it means we have an opportunity not to ignore, but an opportunity to make that which is important to us, number one. So this is a word to believers, not to those outside of the faith. The danger described isn't rejecting salvation, 
though the principle certainly applies there also, but the danger of neglecting salvation. So if this is written to Christians, it's a reminder that you need to set your anchor down deep and have it anchored to your soul. And the word of God is your anchor and Jesus is your anchor. And if you are anchored in Christ, my friends, you will not be blown to and fro by the winds and the waves. You will be set on solid ground. Okay? So great a salvation. When we consider something great, we will naturally pay attention to it. We will not neglect it. If the Bucks weren't in the Super Bowl, I may have, you know, talked more. I may have, you know, taken breaks and maybe, you know, left the room during the game and talked to other people and that kind of thing. But when it comes to the Word of God and Jesus and my relationship with Jesus, it has to be primary, my friends. It has to be number one. You need to make Jesus number one again. I'm speaking to Christians this morning. I'm speaking to those that have been drifting. Oh, I know it's subtle. I know it's just slight. And I know it doesn't seem like you've gone very far, my friends, but look up. See how far you've gone from where you used to be, where you used to anchor and pay attention. If we do not consider something great, we leave it to convenience rather than commitment. I like that quote. If it's great to you, do not leave it to convenience, but make it a firm, wonderful commitment. The phrase, so great a salvation, is a striking reminder of what God has provided in Christ for you. The word so is similar to the instance in the familiar passage, God so loved the world, right? John 3, 16, we all know it, and expresses an unfathomable depth. Therefore, if we neglect something, we probably do not consider it great. For our salvation is great. So great a salvation, my friends. If you neglect it, don't call it great. Don't call it important. Don't call it a commitment. You do not turn your back on those things that you consider great. If you are drifting from the Lord Jesus this morning, I want to say, remember how great he is, how powerful he is, how much he loves you, and then allow yourself to pull back that string and get close to that anchor. Tie it on your boat so that anchor is right below you, that you are not drifting anymore, my friends, that you are back in the word of God, that you are close to the Lord, and that you are serving him. So I'm going to read this in conclusion. Um, basically, it's Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. We must pay the most careful attention Therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed to the will of God. And we're going to stop there. But I just want to remind you that in conclusion, my friends, don't allow your friends to drift. Don't allow your family to drift. Hold on to that anchor and make sure your rope is tight, that you don't get blown around by everything that's happening. You know, there's people that... Because of this, this, uh, this virus, you know, and, and, and the uncertainty of what's going on in our world right now, there's people that are just absolutely not plugged into church. And I understand they're watching it on TV, my friends, but it's not quite the same. You need to be feeding yourself by getting into the Word of God and praying and allowing the Holy Spirit to permeate your life. Speak to your heart. Right? It's all about Jesus. But be careful, my friends, because the Bible says that we can drift away. 
I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation. I am saying that if you drift away, you will lose your effectiveness. You will lose your ability to discern. You will lose your power. You'll be carried away into sinful behaviors and nonsensical things that do not produce fruit in your lives. My friends, get back to your first love. Come back to Jesus, your anchor, and make sure that you're in his word and spending time with him. Tomorrow, we're going to go a little bit further through Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 13. So if you want to read ahead, we can, um, we're going to focus on that tomorrow. We just didn't get to it today, but we will certainly get to it tomorrow. And again, I'm sorry for getting on late. Uh, it wasn't because of a waffle. I was here. I was ready. I had my homework done. Um, it was because I was talking to friends. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for this reminder that the writer of Hebrews wants to remind us that even though we have this great salvation, so great a salvation, he says, we still have a propensity to drift away. Father, have mercy on us. The world is a current that is trying to take us and make us more like them, trying to make us worldly, trying to get us to think worldly and to have worldly behaviors. Father, I pray for all those who are listening to me today that they would repent of any worldly thought, worldly behavior, action, or sin that they've committed and that they will tie tight to the anchor of God that they will not drift away, which is your word, which is Jesus. We love you and we thank you, God, for reminding us to stay tied up to you and tied to your word through prayer because that's where the power is. That's where the victory is. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you guys again for joining us. I see all your names there, but I was really dialed into my message. And so I don't get to recognize all of you, but I did see your names and I see you there, Nan. Thank you for joining us. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Don't forget today is Wednesday, which means we're coming into the sanctuary at 6 p.m. There's plenty of space for you to social distance and join in our Bible study. And if you can't make it, go to the Park Place Facebook page. I'll see you there at 6 p.m. Be blessed, my friends. Love you guys.